Hi, everybody. I'm Rich Folly, and you are now at the Miami Book Fair with PBS Books coverage of Miami Book Fair 2017, an amazing three-day weekend festival here in Miami with readers prowling all around downtown Miami on the campus of Miami-Dade College. It's one of our favorite times of the year, the Miami Book Fair. And kicking off our show today, we have Mariko Tamaki, who's the author of many books, but most recently, Lumberjanes, Unicorn Power. Yeah, welcome. You're kicking off our coverage today. What do you think, first of all, about this festival and this fair? I love this festival. I love today because today is when all the students are around and they're just like so like so pumped to be here. And yeah. I love like I love seeing kids sitting on steps reading books. Like just like warms my heart. Yeah, Friday we should point out to people watching is Young Readers Day at the Miami Book Fair and you have thousands of school children running around all with books in their hand. I think they all run away with books and they have yeah. books and they come to your events and they're so enthusiastic. Yeah, and actually the event I just did, they all had the books in front of them so they were reading along as I was reading, which was like, it was just, it was making me very happy. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's a wonderful thing to see. It's yeah. true enthusiasm, true love of books and reading. That's one of the reasons why we like covering these events because here you see real passion and enthusiasm for books yeah. right in front of your face all over the place. I love it. And they all join up. Well, let's talk about Lumberjanes a little bit. Lumberjanes began as a very popular comic series done by Boom Studios, um, sort of legendary. It became like this huge thing, and yeah. you're now adapting it for a middle grade audience. Talk about a little bit about, if you wouldn't mind, that original comic series and how that may have influenced you, and then just the task of bringing it to a younger group of readers. Well, so the original creators were Shannon Waters, Grace Ellis, Noelle Stevenson, and Brooklyn Allen. Uh, and they created it, and I always get the date wrong, so I'm not going to say it anymore. <laughs> um, but it was a yeah, it was a little comic book series about you know this camp of hardcore lady types, and it was a huge like an amazing success. And I knew about it and was obsessed with the comic for years, um, like in a real like a fan type of way. Um, and then I got a call one day asking me if I would. If it was a project I would hypothetically be interested in. Wow, that must have really been a was, call to get. Oh, my God. I was in a hotel room, and my agent sent me an email that was like, do you like the Lumberjanes? <laughs> like, can I call you? And I was like, I'm not leaving my hotel until you call me back. Like, I was like, I'm not going to dinner. I just sat on the bed and waited for her to call me back. Uh, so it was really, I mean, it's, it's really great to love the characters that you're writing about. It's, they're not sort of your original characters. And I just do. I have such an affection for all of these characters. So it was really just about sort of finding the perfect way to sort of present them in a way that had the spirit of the original books and really connected to the original comics and sort of staying true to the voices and stuff. So, I mean, it's great when your job means reading your favorite comic book for research. Yeah, I'm envious. We should talk a little bit about the characters that you, that you brought to life in the book. Uh, it's Joe, it's Mal, it's Molly, it's Ripley. It's April. It's these five lumberjanes. They're part of this camp. Yep. And I'm going to have to read the name of the camp because, like, I yes. don't think we talked about it earlier. I was going to throw it to you. Yes. But that's like a test. No. And I don't want to do that to you. No, I don't do that. It's Miss Quinzella Thisquins Penny Quequel Thistle Crumpets Camp yes. for hardcore lady types. Yes. For hardcore lady types being one of the key elements here. Yes. These are very girl centric comics. And the stories and the relationships between them are really about sort of this female empowerment, girl power thing. That's a pretty exciting part of these comics, too. Yeah, I mean, it's very friendship to the max. Like, that is the main thing about these books. And I think it's really great because there is kind of a trend, I think, in a lot of books, especially about girls, that's about being mean and about one girl. Like, there's always a point in, there's a point in a lot of books where, for no reason, one girl turns on another and stops being her friend. And it's very nice to create a space where, as a young reader, you know that that's not going to happen. Right. Like, people have misunderstandings and all of that but because the main sort of sentiment is friendship to the max you know that everything is going to be okay and I think that that's a really great thing to kind of hold up for young girls is this idea of teamwork also this idea that the thing that you have conflict with and typically in girl books it's with each other as opposed to with the elements or survival skills or any of those things so this really shifts the focus onto yeah, like, what can you accomplish when you work together? Right. I think that's one of the things I love about the comic and that I love about this, this book is that this really truly is about filling in the holes and gaps and relationships that the power of, a, of, of the five girls together becomes yeah. like a superpower. I mean, yeah. truly, if they're working all in one in unison and, and sort of looking out for each other. And I'd also point out that the, uh, the actual Lumberjanes field manual, which is yes. in like the very front of the book, 
I think it's a field manual for our times. I mean, I think we all could use a little bit more of um, all the elements that are in this field manual manual that I think maybe the world could use a little more of these days. Yeah, I mean, I think the idea of doing your best and really sort of codifying it, like doing your best, not because of any, any sort of higher power, but because you want to do your best, like regardless of, you know, your community context or whatever, you just want to be the best person you can be. And I think that's a really great thing to set forth but also still making it fun. Like all the badges they earn are puns, like all like the um, s'more the merrier, which is about making s'mores, obviously. And may the forge be with you, which is one of my favorite badges, which is about metal smithing, obviously. Um, so it's like you want to do these things and you're going to learn, but it's going to be fun. Like it's not going to be, you know, like and also all the different characters are various levels of like overachiever. Like from like a like a ten to like a seven, uh, so that you get to see like different characters reacting to this task of like being the best, being the best scout you can be. Yeah, and the other element that I, I love about the this is that there's these sort of you, you talked about the puns, this sort of homage to sort of great women in in contemporary yeah. history. I mean, there's all this sort of like what the and they will throw in some name of right. some pop star or something that's been around for what the Joan know, Jet. Yeah, what the Joan Jet, right, yeah. or something like that that you start to you know, sort of being able to sort of lay the groundwork for the, for the women that came before. Well, I'd like to think that the book is something that you can read, especially as a young reader. I think adults who read it will laugh at the references and the, you know, allusions. But, I mean, I really wrote the book to think, thinking that kids would see a name and not necessarily know who it is, but then go look up that person and find out, you know, like famous, like female astronauts or mountain climbers or whatever. All of the names are references to, you know, heroes. Right. Plus, plus unicorns. Uh, and unicorns. Right. Well, unicorns was like the first idea that I had was to do like something about unicorns. Why? Right. What is it about unicorns that, that fascinates you? I truly don't know. I think it's like a little kid, my little pony hangover. Like I'm still like in love with the idea of like a magical creature. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then we just decided like, well, let's do unicorns with a twist. So my idea was that the unicorns would smell really bad because that. I just thought that was really funny. And so, <laughs> and then describing bad smells is really funny. So it just became this like ongoing joke yeah. to add into the book. So you mentioned Brooke Allen. She's your illustrator for these books. She also is one of the original founders of the Lumberjane series. What has it been like for her? You've been working with her to sort of make that jump from an older reader generally to the younger reader version of these characters. Uh, well, Brooklyn Allen, who uses they, them, uh, is, has been just an incredible person to work with. And I think it was really great to have somebody who is like so much a part of the original series and like obviously because you know they did the original illustrations um but it's also just like fun to work with somebody and like Brooklyn just has like this really like all the illustrations are you know are their idea like you know (laughs) there's like a series of plaques which I described in the book and then Brooklyn put all these plaques had these all these additional plaques of like most spaghetti eaten like most ingredients in an omelet or whatever. So it's like this like this ongoing, like they're like little like Easter eggs that you hide in of little jokes and stuff. Yeah, there's the, 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 the world that you live in now with, with graphic novels and comics and, and sort of the novelization form of these graphic novels is very collaborative. There seems yeah. to be such an energy around helping each other out. Yeah. Not to say that there isn't competition. I'm sure that there is, but yet there's this difference it seems like in this field can you explain that well I think it really is this idea that I mean a lot of art is so solitary and it's just you and your desk and the coffee shop or whatever it is you do your thing um and I think the idea that you're doing something with somebody else that you're sharing that experience and the responsibility it's just like another layer of things like I think it just makes you feel it just like on a very like cheesy level, it just feels like teamwork. It just feels like you know friendship you're going to do- the max. Yeah, it's super friendship to the max. And uh, yeah, Brooklyn has been super fun, and also because we get to go to conventions together, so you have someone who can be your convention buddy. Yeah. So you're not just like sitting at a table alone with your pen. You're like with your friend. Uh, so that's been really fun, and it's also fun because you can sort of like we had this really great dinner, and we just sort of hashed out like the next two books, just like you know over french fries like what it could potentially be and it was really fun yeah you know your uh your book this one summer we talked to you not too long ago it was the los angeles times i think festival of books about um has gone on to become this really important book in the graphic novel world you something you can be really proud of that you did with your cousin 
Jillian. It's also last year was on the list of the most banned books of all the books. Um, it was the most challenged book of most challenged book, right? Sorry. Yeah. I mean that. I mean, on one hand, you're like, nice, we're pushing the envelope. <laughs> on the other hand, you're like, wow, what is wrong with us? Explain how that might made you feel, and and how do we res- how do you respond when your book is the one that's at the top of that list? Well, it's weird because as a Canadian, it's weird to be like number one. Like it feels very <laughs> un-Canadian to like to describe anything I do as number one. Um, and I think on the one hand, uh, you know, we're in really incredible company. Like Sherman Alexi is also on the list. John Green is also on the list. So there's books that I greatly admire uh, that have been singled out in this way. Uh, it's also significant that of the top 10 books that were the most banned, the top five were banned for LGBTQ content. So really, I think it's a matter of, like, uh, I always quote my favorite linguist, Deborah Cameron, who says that with change comes conflict. And I think that there is an increasing number of publishers that are putting LGBTQ content in books for mm-hmm. kids. And so now there's this increasing pushback against it. Um, and I mean, the fact that this one summer was tagged for having LGBTQ content when there's literally one mention, like one actual word in the book that it, that mentions like a lesbian camp right which is which is silly and right. obviously we there's so many of us that don't understand that right and yet as, it had to be in the back of your mind as you're as you're adapting lumberjanes which has overt L- lgbt oh, sure. elements in it and then now you're bringing it to a younger audience knowing what you're going to face when you start to put that into words for middle grade readers how did you go about tackling that and is it even in your mind or do you just plow forward i mean i'm just so happy that it's there and, uh, I mean, going into this project and working with Abrams and working with Boom Studios, I mean, it, it's, it's where it's at. It's not like we had to get it to that place. Um, and it was really exciting. It's exciting to talk about, you know, because it's, it's, especially with regards to, you know, the kind of queerness of, like, you know, girls liking each other. Like, girls liking each other is just something that happens like when you're hands, a kid. Friends, yeah. Or just like liking each other, yeah, having yeah. feelings about a person. <laughs> and it's not about anything, you know, it's not like it's inappropriate because it's the feelings that you have when you're a kid. So it's about really just em- like embracing and loving that part of all of these characters. And it's been actually really fun. Yeah, and it, things are moving so quickly. A part of it is because of the work that you do and other writers like yourself do. If you think about 2000. 2000- 15. Oh, sure. It's very different from 2016 in yeah. this regard and, and very different from 2017. We seem to be hurtling through this period and yet we find ourselves fighting the same battles, it seems like, sometimes at the same time. I, if, if we can stay, this, you know, stay stationary at the same time we're moving at light speed, that's sure. what's happening right now, it feels like sometimes. Well, and I understand. Like, I mean, I, I'm totally like, sympathetic to a person's feelings of discomfort or, you know, like a like feelings of like, well, this is not familiar with me and I don't feel comfortable with this. I'm so down with that. But then it's a matter of like what you do with that feeling. Like, you know, I think it is the way things are moving. Like I was so happy to see Australia just voted on this huge referendum they had yes on gay marriage. And so I feel like it's, we're just in that place now. Yeah. And I don't think you can go back. You can't stuff the rainbow back in the box, you know? Like, <laughs> no. Once you let the rainbow out. Do you get tired of talking about it? Do you get, I mean, are you ready to like move on to the time when like this is not even an issue? And then, of course, I mean, who wouldn't be? But is it something that you feel like, here we go again, whenever this topic comes up? Yeah, I mean, I'm ready to have both conversations. I think that it is, especially, I understand still when you're talking about YA, that it is still like a, it's still a negotiation for some people. Uh, But, like, that's why in terms of the book banning, it can be frustrating because, uh, you know, there are definitely, like, the book can be pulled off the shelves, but a lot of the times what principals and librarians have told me is that a person will just take the book off the shelf and put it under the desk and not officially do anything, just, like, remove it from the conversation. And I think the only way you actually move forward is by having the conversation. It's like, you know, dinner table with your family. If you just never talk about anything, like, it's fine. You can still have your turkey. But it's like... (laughs) It's not going to change until right. you like sit down and say, like, we have to talk about this stuff. That's right. Um, Lumberjanes is really interesting and in that uh, the, 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 the way that you write these characters and the, and the way we learn about them is really interesting. I mentioned earlier to you off camera that, we, that PBS is launching a show called The Great American Read Program. And I was curious about some of the influences that you've had in your life and your career and maybe how they influence Lumberjanes and other books that you've written. Yeah. I mean, well, first of all, I'm Canadian. Uh, so most of my hardcore literary influences are, you know, the Margaret Atwoods, uh, and the Alice Munro's of this world. 
Um, but it was interesting. So for this book, because it was uh, to describe five characters and describe them, giving them all equal weight, I was really sort of stumped because I am generally a first person writer uh, as to how to sort of bring them all together. And so I was actually, I am a huge Douglas Adams fan. Uh, and so I was rereading uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and I just thought, like, oh, this is the way to do this, is to have, like, a third-person voice that is the sort of omniscient voice that can sort of be its own voice in the book. Uh, and that will be the sort of way to sort of see everybody equally and kind of, like, place them all in the same field. Um, and I, I mean, I think the thing about Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that has always stuck with me is that it is so unmistakably that book. Like, it's so potent. Every page is so fantastically funny and so, like, you know, so precious to me. Like, I read that book incredibly slowly, and I've read it more than once because I just never want to miss anything that he says, <laughs> that he writes. It is a completely unique style, that yeah. book. It's sci-fi, comedy, you know, that's just unusual. Like, there's nothing like it. But it's that formal informalness too, right? That kind of like aristocratic, like like the sense of knowing <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, being well-educated and let me just tell you, but also in these like, you know, these weird jokes. Like that kind of like, <laughs> like it's, it's an incredibly like knowledgeable book that's making fun of knowledge, yeah. right? Like that's making fun that the, the reason that this book, which is incredibly the smartest book in the world, is the most incredible is because it's slightly cheaper. Yeah. You know, like, I, I love that stuff. Did you always read where you were a reader from a very young age? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, uh, I was definitely um, not always reading the best stuff. In fact, uh, one of the other things on, on your, is that Flowers in the Attic by V.C. Andrews. So I was definitely one of those kids when, like, everybody was reading a book like Sweet Valley High. It went, like, Sweet Valley High, like, Constancy Green, then, like, Sweet Valley High, and then... Flowers in the Attic. Yeah. And it was like watching a soap opera. But, right, but you're reading. And, oh, and it, yes. It was, like, it was a stepping stone from one thing to the next. Well, and also because it was a series of books, you know, it's always thrilling to your parent when you're like, I want to buy the next book. Right. I am going to continue reading. <laughs> and that's one of the things that I will always plunk down money for for my kids. Yeah, exactly. Another book? Absolutely. I will buy you another Here book. Here you go. Another like, iPhone? Maybe not, you know? Right. No, <laughs> I think it is. I mean, reading is so, like, one of the things that I really wanted for this book was I wanted it to be a book that a parent can read to a kid or that a kid can read every night before they go to bed, or you can read the whole thing all right. at once. So the, jap the chapters are deliberately short so that it's like a plausible, like, we're going to go to bed, I'm going to read you one chapter, and then you're going to go to bed. Yeah. And that, to me, is like the best thing. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. And I can feel it, too. And I'm so glad that it's here. There's got to be a lot more coming. You said you plan two more at least. We know there's probably there's more. There's four. Okay. Uh, so there's four. The second one is called The Moon is Up. Uh, and then I'm, I don't have a title for the third yeah. one yet. Well, they're coming. That's all we need to know. The, the book is Lumberjanes Unicorn Power, book one in the new adaptation of the Lumberjanes series. So cool to have you, Mariko. Thank you very Thanks much for very me. much for being here. Yeah, yeah, cheers. Thank you. Thanks for being with PBS. All right, folks, there's so much more to come. Well, Miami Book Fair 2017 is underway. So is our coverage. Stay tuned. There's lots more.